We're talking to a couple of national experts who are leading the way to more religious freedom. Hi, I'm Peyton Luke, and you're watching First Liberty Live. At a recent First Liberty event, Stewart had the opportunity to talk to a couple leading legal experts, one a top attorney, the other a respected law professor. Each of them is leading the way in religious freedom. Here's Stewart with the first interview. We are here talking with Allison Ho, who is one of the top attorneys in the country. Uh, this person to my right has argued at the Supreme Court. She has brought cases before every federal appeals court in the country, litigated cases at each one. She's also, thankfully, a longtime volunteer attorney with First Liberty Institute because we like having highly capable and experienced attorneys working with us on these cases. Hi, Allison. Hi. First, I, I want to hit you with the biggest question of all. Why is religious freedom something that you uh, devote time to? Why is it something, because you could be busy doing a lot of other things, but you choose to work on religious freedom cases with us. Why is that? So to me, religious liberty, it really is our first freedom. And, uh, you know, we live in a country that religious liberty is a founding value and virtue. Um, so many of uh, the people that came to this country at great cost and sacrifice, they came. Um, they came for religious liberty. Um, it's as American as apple pie. And it's just a real honor to be able to work with First Liberty um, to uh, help vindicate rights of, of ordinary, ordinary people. Um, and I really think, uh, you know, you said I could be doing other things or time, but I, I really think I'm the one who's the beneficiary that I get to work with First Liberty and get to litigate these cases and really help vindicate our first freedom. We're grateful that you spend your time doing that. You mentioned in, in, in what you just said that religious freedom is foundational to our freedoms. How does religious freedom connect with the other constitutional freedoms that we usually think of when we think of the the Bill of Rights yeah so I think it's it's um, it comes first right it's in our uh, First Amendment and I think um, you know religious liberty doesn't just mean you know there's no established church and you can go to and worship at your place it really means you can live out your faith in your life um, and I think that is just so important and I think that that really suffuses all of the rights that we have as Americans and what the founders, you know, we are a nation of the people, by the people, um, and for the people. And so the idea of people, of individuals being able to exercise those rights, there's just, there's nothing more foundational, I think, just to us as people as what we believe. Um, and if we aren't able to express that, not just on uh, Sunday mornings uh, in our place of worship, but if we're not able to really live our lives according to what we believe, I just think that was just so foundational to our our country and how it was founded. And again, it's just an honor to be able to today uh, work with and help defend the rights of ordinary Americans to such fundamental freedoms as freedom of conscience and freedom of religion and exercise of their faiths. And while we're here, I want to spend some time reminiscing with you about some of the cases that you've helped us out with. Uh, one of the early ones was the Mount Soledad Cross, uh, which is a memorial on top of a very prominent peak just north of San Diego. You can look out across the Pacific Ocean. You can look southward to downtown. It's very visible. It's a cross on government property. So if you follow these things, it's no surprise that somebody challenged it. Tell us what you remember about that case and why it was so important. Sure. So that that was a really amazing case to be able to work on for a lot of reasons. Um, one reason sort of close to home for me is my father is a Korean War veteran. He saw combat uh, in, in Korea. And to have the opportunity to stand up for veterans um, as well as religious liberty, which kind of combined in that case, was just an enormous honor. Um, for us. And I, I think in that case also we saw the, the value and the virtue of just never, never giving up. That was a long-running, hard-fought case. Um, but what's really important is today the memorial stands. Um, and around, the wonderful, wonderful thing around is around the memorial cross are all sorts of plaques um, and stories of veterans and their families. Um, so it is just visiting there is an amazing experience um, to be able to see how the memorial stands for those veterans um, and what it means to those veterans that the memorial still stands today. And so to be a part of that effort of preserving that memorial and the way that it 
honors the incredible sacrifices of men and women who have allowed us to have the freedoms that we have today was just an amazing experience for me. And, and that was a, a, roughly a decade ago. Yes. And, and the solution was a, a property swap. Basically, when you go up to it, there's a circular drive that goes around the entire memorial. And when you step from the street onto the sidewalk, you're stepping from public to private property, which is run by an association. Yes, and we sort of expected that transfer um, to be challenged uh, once once that took place. Um, but I think I think once once First Liberty was was on the scene and the other side understood that we were in it to win it, we were in it for the long haul. I think they de they decided to move on. So I think that that was a battle that we won without having to fight it, which are in some senses the best battles of all. Sometimes that's the best way. Since then, we've won the Bladensburg Peace Cross case on the opposite coast over in Maryland, and that now serves to protect the Mount Soledad Cross as well and memorials all over the country, even if they're on government property, I might yes. add, that that, that that is covered by the history and tradition of the country. Uh, another case you helped us out with, just want to touch on it briefly, I dealt with invocations. It was out of Jackson County, Michigan, and it was with invocations before public meetings of the county county commission, I guess it was? Yes, that's right. And so, um, you know, for decades, for centuries, um, uh, government bodies in America have opened their meetings um, with acknowledgments um, of God, of faith. Um, that is also something that's kind of interwoven in, in the tapestry of America. And so it was a great privilege to stand and to prevail on behalf of um, a local board um, that wanted to do that, that same, that same practice um, and to be able to vindicate their their ability to follow in a tradition as old as the Republic. Yeah. I, one that you're currently working with this on involves Heather Rooks. Uh, she ran for a school board in Arizona, I believe it is, and they give them some free time, uh, some time to make their own comments uh, during each meeting for each member of the board, and she decided that she would open her personal comment time with a scripture verse, and they said, oh no, no, you can't do that. No, that's that's exactly right, and, and and again, that using using scripture um, to to mark on public occasions is as old as the republic itself. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, um, even more more recent presidents have have done it. So, I think what all of these cases show um, is just the battle that we're in and and what we're up against. And I'm really grateful for organizations like First Liberty um, that really stand up and and fight the fight. And again, it's just a really privilege to be able to do that um, shoulder to shoulder with y'all. And part of our model is to work with volunteer attorneys around the country, and you've been a very helpful one over the years. Uh, just uh, give us a sense of what it's like working as a volunteer attorney with First Liberty. How does that function in real life? Oh, it is, it is such a blessing um, to be able to be a volunteer attorney. Um, my very first, you mentioned the arguments that I've done. My mm -hmm. very first argument in private practice years ago as a baby lawyer was for First Liberty. Um, and it gives you um, a chance uh, as a lawyer to litigate some of the most important issues of the day um, that they're also personally really rewarding to be able to litigate. And to also work hand in hand with an organization that does such a great job of um, you know, getting getting the cases right and bringing you in, and it, I think it's a really great partnership. Um, we're we're really given the the freedom to litigate the case um, and to kind of be front and center and making arguments, um, but we do it hand in hand, and we get the tremendous benefit of First Liberty's experience um, for decades with with all of these cases. So it's just it's just a really rewarding partnership. Well, we can't do it without you and the many other volunteer attorneys that help us do that. Allison Ho, thank you so much for making some time for us. Thank you so much. It's my pr privilege. Louisiana recently passed a bill that says that the Ten Commandments need to be posted in every classroom. Stewart gets some insight from a law professor to see how that squares up with recent Supreme Court decisions and the Constitution. 
I want to introduce you to Josh Blackman. He is a professor at South Texas College of Law down in Houston. He's the Centennial Chair of Constitutional Law, which sounds very erudite. It's a very fancy title. (laughs) He's also written several books along the way, uh, the latest one of which is an introduction to constitutional law for students. So I thought he would be a good person to ask some of the big picture questions about what we're seeing in the headlines right now. Hi, Josh. Good to see you. Uh, It's good to see you, too. First, I want to ask you, Louisiana just passed a law that says the Ten Commandments must be posted in every classroom. Looking at it from the larger perspective, what do you see in that? Is it okay, or have they gone too far? Well, it's a challenge. Um, Nearly four decades ago, the court decided a case called Stone versus Graham, which said that you cannot post Ten Commandments in a classroom. And thinking, well, this might coerce children or perhaps pressure them to feel that they have to be part of religion. Um, the problem, though, with that precedent is based on another decision called the Lemon Test. Mm-hmm. Lemon said you can't even have any sort of entanglement between church and state. A couple of years ago, the court overruled the Lemon Test in a first liberty decision called Kennedy v. Bremerton. And we were thrilled with that you were, outcome. You were very happy with it. Yeah. So the wrinkle is you have this precedent called Stone v. Graham, which has no Ten Commandments, but it's based on a decision that's since been undermined and, and overruled. So what Louisiana, I think, is trying to do is create a test case that is a way to challenge whether Stone v. Graham is still good law and whether it might survive. Um, if we use the Kennedy case as the precedent, uh, I think the Ten Commandments would probably be okay, as long as it's just passive, it's just sort of sitting in the wall, no one's forcing students to read it or to study it or to even to invoke it. It's probably uh, not what's called coercive on children, no more than Kennedy saying his prayer quietly at the 50-yard line after the game concluded. Yeah. I, uh, teaching it in a historical perspective, that fits within the law? I, I think so. Um, until the 1950s, schools throughout the country posted the Ten Commandments. Indeed, schools throughout the country actually opened the day with the prayer. That happened to a case called Everson. Um, the Everson decision was a very important ruling by the Warren Court, which said we need to have this sort of strict separation of church and state. I'm sure as your viewers know, that's not actually in the Constitution. Nowhere to be found. And this notion of a separation of church and state is basically this novel uh, development in the law. What the current court's doing is sort of chipping away at that and saying that, well, you can have religion as long as it's not coercing people, force them to adopt a particular faith. So um, I think if the court sort of stays consistent with the Kennedy case, the Ten Commandments would probably be okay. Uh, but the wrinkle, though, is you have to lose in the lower court first. The lower court's bound by the precedent. They'll say, rule against Louisiana, the Lu- rule against Louisiana, and hope the Supreme Court takes the case. If they don't take the case, then it's over. That's a really helpful perspective. You mentioned the, the lemon test being struck down, and, and we've explained that quite a bit uh, in the videos that we've done. From where you sit, what else can now be challenged now that lemon is no longer the, is something that the courts have to follow? Well, I I alluded to it a moment ago, which is prayer in school. And this is one of these areas where there's a very long-standing tradition of prayer in public places, in state legislatures, in town council meetings, and even in schools. That came to a stop in the 1950s with the Everson decision. And I think there's actually a fairly sustained movement to try to overrule Everson Everson to say it's inconsistent with the the, 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 pro, the more recent decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, another case is called Levy Weissman. This is a case from the early 1990s where the court held you can't have a rabbi give a fairly say, bland speech at a graduation ceremony for high schoolers and thinking well, students might feel coerced. I think where the court is sort of getting at it is unless there's actual evidence of coercion saying you must recite this prayer, It probably passes muster, but again, the court has to sort of revisit and overrule these long-standing precedents, which have been pretty deeply woven into American fabric, where now in a public school, you don't have any sort of prayer. That's that's considered a no-no. There was a time when they wanted an amendment to the Constitution to allow prayer in school. That was actually a thing in the 80s. It never really went anywhere. But, but, But... the court has to sort of revisit a lot of these older doctrines to allow this to go forward. I'm old enough to remember my first grade teacher uh, teaching us the Lord's Prayer and also teaching us the 23rd Psalm. Uh, kids today have no idea that that was ever a thing in public school. It's amazing how much things can change in what, a lifetime. What year was that when you were in first grade? I, I, it was in the 1800s. 1800s, actually. that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think... <laughs> Early I, 1960s. I think that's right around when things started to change and the court shifted its doctrine. It happened almost overnight where the yeah. Warren Court said you must remove this immediately, and that affected school districts across the country. 
Yeah. I, I'd like to get you to opine, if you will. Uh, we're at a First Liberty event. You were just on a panel. And we've talked quite a bit uh, about what the court has replaced the lemon test with, with history and tradition. That's mm -hmm. the new test. And uh, I really in, uh, appreciated the analysis you gave to what it's going to be like trying to apply the history mm -hmm. and tradition test. So I'd like you to share that with us so we can sure. all hear it. Sure. So uh, history and tradition, right? What does that mean? History is the sort of stuff that happened before the Constitution was ratified that might inform the meaning. You know, what were the practices of prayer, for example, in the, in the colonial legislatures, in the state legislatures after the Declaration of Independence, right? What were the traditions there? Tradition means after the Constitution was ratified, what did the people do? So an easy example, the very first Congress hired a chaplain to administer prayer before each session began at the House of Representatives. Uh, President George Washington gave a very famous um, a speech uh, on Thanksgiving, which had very robust references to God and providence and the like. Um, so you have the tradition, as your teacher would reflect, prayer being mentioned in school at the start of the, uh, start of the school day. When you have these very long-standing traditions, that suggests that those things are basically part of the Constitution, perhaps. And the fact that people did this for so long, there's not really an objection suggests that it's okay. So I think the Establishment Clause is one area where the court has a lot of room to sort of peel back on some of the excesses from the Warren Court from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And you mentioned that history is something where you can look it up in a book and follow it. Tradition, though, by coming after, may or may not align with what's in the Constitution, and that sets up a problem as we move ahead. Right. I mean, there's this concept, it's a little technical, liquidation. What does that mean? Uh, in the Federalist Papers, James Madison explained that the meaning of law is not always clear, and that sometimes if you look to a long-standing, continuous practice, it basically gives meaning to the Constitution. That is, if the Constitution says X and people are doing Y, Y and X might actually be the same thing, right? It sort of merges. They, 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 they put basically a layer on top of the Constitution of what it means. Mm -hmm. And so in the religious context, we, we had a very long-standing tradition of using religion in the public square and otherwise, and that sort of came to a halt in the mid-20th century. Uh, but if we want to look at tradition, that could provide some ground to um, scale back some of those precedents. Uh, Oklahoma just passed a law, and this fits into all this, that requires schools to teach the Bible as part of classroom curriculum and how it fits into the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into all this? Again, as long as it's not proselytizing, I think there's a difference between saying, here's the Bible, you must adopt this as your belief, versus here's the Bible, we're going to read about it, and we're going to read some passages. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the Kennedy precedent, that, that would probably pass muster. Um, I think that if you want to just put on a spectrum, having a Ten Commandments in the wall is far more passive. It's sort of there, no one's talking about it. Um, reading a, a verse of scripture, perhaps in the morning, is probably another end of the spectrum. And then saying the Bible somewhere in the middle where it's not quite praying, but you're perhaps learning it. You know, for example, read the book of Job, you can learn about one of the greatest, greatest literary works in world history. Mm -hmm. I, before I let you go, I want to get your thoughts on the current state of the Supreme Court as far as the slate of justices we have currently mm -hmm. and how that fits into the long historical arc of the court. Well, we have now the most conservative court since the 1930s and probably the court with the greatest protection of religious liberty ever. Um, again, I don't want to sort of I criticize the court a lot, but in this area they've been pretty good. Uh, in the span of a couple years, they've ruled the lemon test they provide more protection for uh, a parent seeking funding for their religious schools. Mm -hmm. uh, they've issued decisions involving, um, if you remember COVID, that was the thing, right? Can houses of worship stay open during COVID? Uh, they, they, they sort of push back on a lot of the vaccine mandates, not all of them, but some of them, um, uh, which are some based on religious grounds. So this is a very strong court for religious liberty. I have my quibbles, I have my problems with them, but on the establishment clause, there's no there's no breaking. They're pretty solid. Very good. I, uh, President Biden recently said that he would uh, suggest reforms to the court. And the things that we've heard about that have been discussed along the way are everything from uh, changing, uh, adding tenure rules that you can only serve so long to adding additional seats to the court. What are your thoughts on that effort? What would that do if they were successful? I think from a legal perspective, a lot of these proposals are dubious. I don't know they could do term limits without a constitutional amendment. I think Article three of the Constitution guarantees life tenure, and trying to deviate from that really creates problems. Um, I'm not even sure that, that term limits are a good idea. I used to support them. I sort of backed off that, because I think it would create these incentives where people have like, okay, I'm here for 18 years. Let me really do some crazy stuff versus <laughs> this is my job, this is my life, and I will, I will, I will do the job faithfully. 
Very good. Josh Blackman, great talking to you. Appreciate your insights. Thank you, sir. We have an ongoing campaign to help Americans understand the devastating impact of the proposals for court reform. You can go to SupremeCoup.com to learn more. First Liberty, fighting for what matters most.